On the day after his death, it looked as if whatever small mark he left on the world would rapidly disappear. Instead, his impact on human history has been unparalleled. All this from a man who could have been voted least likely to change the world. Anyone who takes the time to examine his teachings and try out his way of life ends up asking themselves in wonder, who is this man? Who is this man? In a moment, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 14, a few of the verses there. Uh, there are two prominent people in that story. We're going to focus on uh, both ends of the spectrum, somebody who is extremely successful and somebody who is a social outcast in just a moment. We're glad to have you in worship today, whether you're online or whether you're in the room. It's important that we pray about this, that uh, less of me and more of the Lord, and I would just be used for his purpose to, um, to help you and, and to grow myself in a better understanding of how God loves me and what he wants to do for us. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all the assembled, near or far, may they prove acceptable in your sight. Lord, speak to us. We all have need for direction. We have need for assurance. We are confused by life's issues. Lord, bless us with a better understanding and a greater confidence because of your involvement, your love for us in our life. Through Christ, amen. Well, let me take you back, unless you're already back there, if you're in grade school or, or still a child, uh, perhaps not take you back, but just ask you a prominent question. What is it that you want to be when you grow up? What did you want to be when you were growing up? I grew up in a small town, Huntington, Indiana. Looks pretty large there, and that must have been taken in the 60s. It's uh, uh, seeing the, in the prominence there, the, the courthouse. It reminds me a lot, a lot of Union, Missouri. You know, the only reason that you tend to go through Union, Missouri, unless you live in Franklin County, because that's the county seat, is because Highway 50 goes through there on its way to Jeff City or down to the lake. It's a nice kind of drive to take. Otherwise, you don't even go downtown. Well, that was the same way with my town. I mean, there were some uh, starting industries there that, that grabbed hold and did pretty well. Square D makes all the electric boxes that you see. Majestic furnaces uh, were made there. Still test ice cream. There was a rock quarry. It was a division headquarters for a railroad uh, company called the Erie Lackawanna. Uh, but back in the day, it was not a very prosperous town. Almost everybody looked at, worked in machine shops. Uh, my dad worked for a factory. Uh, that's the kind of employment that was found there. About 10,000 people. It was the, the center of the county, the county courthouse, Huntington County, Huntington, Indiana. And uh, the reason I took this second picture is that looks exactly like the viaduct that was near my house as Highway 24, just like, like Route 66 was an interstate highway. Highway 24 was one of those as well. And uh, that was near my home. Uh, we lived just outside of town. And I would often uh, go up there. That's where the railroads would cross uh, the highway. And I'd also go up there and watch these big trucks uh, pile through. And when I was in sixth grade, I was asked what it is that I wanted to do for a living. It was kind of one of those whole language assignments where they wanted to check your spelling, they wanted to check your handwriting, and they also wanted to check your ability to put together a paragraph. And, and they just did it through an interesting means. And so we had to write an essay about what we wanted to do. Now, I did not want to be a policeman, did not want to be a fireman, did not want to be a professional athlete or an astronaut, all the things that you would think. In fact, the reason I remember this is because it kind of shocked my teacher, Paul Heinze. I remember when I wrote an essay about I wanted to be a, a truck driver. <laughs> I wanted to be a long-distance truck driver. And he said, why would you possibly want to be a long-distance truck driver? And I said, I've spent my entire life in this town. I want to get out of here. You know, I, want to, I want to go see the world. And those people, I kind of envy them as they whiz through our town. I thought, where are they going? What are they hauling? 
And that was kind of interesting to me. Uh, not everybody uh, wants to be a long distance truck driver. In fact, over here is my granddaughter and she's sitting in the front row. And I want you to whisper in my ear here because that's where my microphone is. What is it you wanna be when you grow up? A cowgirl, a cowgirl, cow that's right. And uh, there she is. Every chance she gets, she rides a horse. In fact, uh, she has taken my wife, her grandmother, out to Perina Farm so many times that she knows the names of all the horses out there. And they have to pet them all and they have to talk to all of them. And uh, she said, because uh, her folks live in a townhouse, she said, you know, we can't have a horse at our house. But Papa, you, you have a big yard. Do you think you could build a fence around your yard and you can build almost anything? Could you build a barn maybe at your house? And she also told me, uh, Jacob and Melissa, that uh, you're gonna live with her the rest of her life because she wants you to help care for the horses. So uh, that's, that's her ambition. And I want to say to you that there's nothing wrong with ambition. Sometimes when you come to church, if, if you've been successful, if you've been ambitious, or right now you're striving for something, you're almost uh, made to feel ashamed for success in the world as though that's not godly. God is not opposed to ambition. In fact, uh, God is a fan of ambition. One of the last stories that Jesus told to his disciples was about a man who owned many things and he was going on a long journey and it was a parable. He was telling a story that they could understand to teach a heavenly meaning and so he left them in charge of his various uh, investments and estates. And when he came back, he was going to ask them to give an account. And the one man that, that he was most disappointed in was the man who did nothing with the gifts that he had received from the master. And that says to me that, you know, he expects us to be ambitious. He expects us to use the opportunities we have to achieve something to his glory and to the benefit of others as well. In fact, uh, in the wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes in chapter nine, you will read this passage. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, you know, at the end of life, when, when you finally lay it all down and you're called home, where you are all going, you're not gonna be able to do that there. You're, there's no working, no planning, no knowledge, no wisdom. This is your moment to take what God has given you and accomplish something. God is not opposed to ambition, but there is an important question. Why are you ambitious? Why are you striving to be successful? And I pray that you are. I think this is the question that we have to ask. Is it a means to an end? Is your ambition, is your success for what purpose to accomplish what? Or is it an end to everything that you do? Is your mere success, is your accomplishment, is your acquisition, is your bank account the end? Is that what you're trying to achieve? Will you be successful in life when you have done that? Or are you being successful in life to accomplish something greater? That's the question the Lord would put before you today. Let's look at it from Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse one today's lesson on greatness redefined. Beginning at verse one. One Sabbath, Saturday in the Jewish culture, uh, when people were restricted from working, uh, when Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee, notice he wasn't just a Pharisee, he was a well-known and successful person. Jesus isn't opposed to him for that, it's okay. You know, it's, in fact, it's, it's great that he was successful and able to uh, be an expert in the law. But Jesus knew that he was being carefully watched and perhaps it was even a setup. There in front of him was also a man suffering from an abnormal swelling of his body. So two people are prominent, the man who was suffering from edema and then this prominent Pharisee. So Jesus asked the Pharisees, not only the man but also his friends and the other experts in the law, let me ask you, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or does that violate your custom and your practice? Hmm. They knew they'd been caught, so they remained silent. They didn't know what to say. So taking hold of the man, Jesus healed him and sent him on his way. And then he makes the point. 
He asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. You know, if you will do that for an animal, and we know that you will, it's common sense that you would do that. You would not let an animal suffer, let alone your child. Then why should I not help one of God's children on the Sabbath day, despite your customs, despite uh, your questioning my judgment in doing this work on the Sabbath? John Ortberg wrote the book that we're uh, basing our series on called Who Is This Man? Regarding this story, uh, he said it's all about social status, all about social standing. Here's a, a quote that he mentioned about this story. He said there was one of the most, this was one of the most awkward dinner parties of all times. Jesus had been invited to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee. And Jesus was also, he knew, being carefully watched. A man with edema, a painful, unattractive, sometimes dangerous condition in which parts of the body fill with fluid was also present. So Jesus was in the home of a prominent Pharisee. Let me just say straight up, it is possible to be a good Christian and be successful. Let's applaud for those people who have done some things with their life. Because I don't think you hear that a lot in church. I, I think you're made to, you know, kind of downplay your success. You know, God has blessed you, and sometimes to your own confusion, uh, for a long time in my past life, I traveled the country and I, lay, I raised money for the seminaries, the, the seminary in Fort Wayne, the seminary in St. Louis. And uh, I spent time in some of the nicest clubs around the country because I was visiting, of course, uh, very successful and very wealthy people. And almost to a fault, when I asked them to tell me their story, they were almost embarrassed by it. And they just said, God does what God does. You know, and I, I can't even explain, you know, why I've been so blessed. They were almost embarrassed and very humble, typically, about the success that they had had. You know, because they realized that it had come from God. In the Bible, there are people who were very, very godly, who were extremely successful and even very wealthy. Abraham, for instance, you know, the father of a great nation. Abraham, our forefather, was so wealthy that his flocks and his nephew's flocks could not coexist. When they came to the land that God would show them, which is now present-day Palestine, the promised land, uh, he said to his nephew Lot, you know, I love you, but uh, we can't coexist. Our herdsmen are arguing. We're fighting over grass. Uh, you take your sizable herd and, and go either in the valley or you live up here and I'll go in the valley. You decide. And so they had to split. They were so successful in life. Job. Uh, was also a wealthy man. You know, the man who suffered uh, uh, all of the events that Satan inflicted upon him. In fact, the reason that he, he suffered was because God said to the devil one time when the devil came in for, you know, kind of a checkup with the Lord, he said, what do you think of my servant Job down there on earth? Isn't he something? The devil said, well, he's something because you've made it profitable to be faithful. But take away his profitability and see if he does not deny you. And so the Lord gave the devil permission to put Job to the test. And he took away everything, including his family, including his health, including his wealth. And Job would not curse God. Even though he did not understand what was going on in his life, he remained faithful. But it was because of his wealth that the devil tempted him. Jacob was blessed by God. In fact, as he fled from Esau, his brother, and went to a distant land, uh, he had this vision of, of uh, the Lord in heaven and the ladder, Jacob's ladder, and angels rising and descending on that ladder. And uh, the Lord promised that he was going to look after him and he was going to bless him. And Jacob promised a tenth, a tithe of every blessing that he would receive. And by the end of his sojourn, when he came back, he too was a wealthy man, made wealthy by God. We could go on and on. David, extremely wealthy, extremely powerful, the most powerful man in his uh, lifetime in the world. Solomon, even more wealthy than his uh, father David. But David understood the question, have you been blessed as an end or a means to an end? At the end of his life, David was a bit frustrated because he had a beautiful palace, a nice home to live in. And he said, and yet God is still being worshiped in a tent, a tabernacle. And so he went to the prophet and he said, 
ask the Lord that I might build a temple worthy of his name. And the message came back to David, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What man could build a temple worthy of me? But I admire you for your desire. Your son will build that temple for me. And David said, well, if I cannot build that temple, at least let me acquire all that will be needed, the money and the, uh, and the means, all the cedars from Lebanon, uh, all of the stone that he will need. Let me gather that together as my last act of blessing to you, Lord, for all of your goodness to me. And then David, at the dedication of those things before he gave them to Solomon and before his death, said, wealth and honor come from God. You are the ruler of all things. In your hand is strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name, but who am I and who are these people that we should be able to so generously give like this? For everything we have, see, David understood, everything we have comes from you, and we've given you back only what you've provided. And then he finished by saying, all our days on earth are like a shadow. Man, they fly by, don't they? And without hope, there's no way we can extend our time on earth. You know, we're all going to die. We're going to spend eternity with the Lord or with not, or, or not with the Lord. Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for the building of a temple uh, for your name comes from your hand. And all of it belongs to you. And I know, my God, that you test the heart and you are pleased with integrity. And so uh, success and ambition wasn't the issue. It's what are you going to do with the success and the blessing that God has given you? That's the question that we need to ask those of us who have been blessed. There was another prominent person there. This person was prominent because of his disability. Uh, he suffered from edema. It was a, a serious disease uh, that caused the swelling of the limbs, almost like elephantitis. It was very painful and even often led to death. It was not only a physically disabling disease, it was also a socially disabling disease. Now, not all of us have been blessed with success. There's another group of people here who struggle, and uh, we've had setbacks, and often not of our own making. Let me just say to you that God is not the cause of your pain and your difficulty. There was a time when Jesus was coming into the city of Jerusalem that they passed by a gate, and there was a man who was blind there who was begging. And the disciples asked the question that all of us who struggle was something beyond our control, ask from time to time. They ask, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? In other words, was it a preemptive strike against this man because he would be an ungodly person that you caused him to suffer in this way? Or was it because of something his parents did that you caused him to suffer in this way? And the Lord said, neither. He said it was so that the Lord might be glorified through his life. Now, in this case, he healed him, and the glory uh, came upon the Lord who gave glory to his father for the healing of that man. Every difficulty in life is an opportunity for us to give glory to God. Even if we are not cured or healed or do not overcome our difficulty, people watch us. And it gives us opportunity to show them how the Lord can sustain us and bring us through the difficulty. He didn't take Noah out of the flood. He brought him through the flood. He doesn't always take us out of our difficulty. He brings us through our difficulty to our benefit, but also to the benefit of our witness. You know, when you're down and out and when you're suffering, people are watching you. And as Christians, that's an opportunity for you to make a statement of faith and the confidence you have in the Lord's provision that other people and even you before that time did not have. Back in the day when I was doing my internship uh, in my training to become a pastor, uh, after college we do two years of academic work at the seminary and then we go out on an internship. My internship was to Minnesota and I was assigned to a prominent pastor, in fact one of the, the strongest churches, one of the most prominent men uh, in Minnesota. And they sent me to him because he had suffered a, a disabling heart attack. 
and uh, he was still a fairly young man, and he was uh, recovering, and, and they wanted to give him some help, and so I was sent to assist him. And I remember it was a struggle, uh, not, not the difficulty of his health, but the struggle was in his wife, uh, who said, you know, we've been sent here to help people, and, and she was embarrassed by all the help that people were trying to give to them. They were dumping food on them. They were calling night and day to see what they could do for them. And I remember the wisdom of my supervisor, a pastor who had suffered this event. Uh, he said to his wife, Evelyn, and I remember hearing him say it, he said, there's also a ministry in allowing others to minister to us. There's always opportunity for God's glory, even in your difficulty, to allow other people to be strong and to minister to you. He was a wise man. The Lord looks at people differently than we look at people. Samuel, when he was sent to find a replacement for King Saul, who had been a bitter disappointment to the Lord, was sent down to the house of Jesse. And of course, David was eventually the son of Jesse who was chosen to be the next great king. But at first, Jesse brought all of his strong and tall and, and warrior sons before the prophet, thinking he would choose one of them. But the Holy Spirit whispered into the prophet's ear, do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected this warrior, this strong, this, this prominent first son of Jesse. Because the Lord does not look at things the way people look at things. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, people would look at those two prominent men in the story of Jesus, a Pharisee and this man suffering from edema. Who is the greater of the two men? Clearly, people would say, the prominent Pharisee, look at how God favors him. And look at what he's been able to achieve in life. But God does not pass judgment in that way. God looks at the heart of a man. And that man suffering from edema was just as important and just as valued, perhaps even more so, than the Pharisee whose priorities were misplaced. Well, the story continues. When he noticed how the guests at that dinner, after he had healed the man, when he noticed how they picked their places of honor at the table, he told them another parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, because there could be a problem. A person more distinguished than yourself might have also been invited. If so, then the host who invited you both will come and say to you, psst, you're going to have to move. I've reserved this place for somebody more important than you. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. Because, of course, that place was still empty. No one would sit there. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let me just say to those of you and those of us who have been blessed, who have, who have, who have been successful, who have achieved things in life, the key to true greatness is not in your success, but in your humility about your success. And this too comes to us in the example of Jesus Christ. When you think about who deserved honor, who deserved glory, who deserved respect and homage, no one more than Jesus Christ. And yet, here's how the scripture describes him. He says, in your relationship with one another, you should have the attitude that Christ Jesus demonstrated. Who, although he was in very nature God, Emmanuel, God with us, he did not demand that kind of respect. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. It was about his purpose. It was about his mission. <laughs> his divine nature was only a means to the end. The end was the salvation of you and me. It was to serve the Lord and to accomplish his purpose. And because of that, he was blessed and he will be given a name above all other names. It's not just good theology, it's good advice for all of us. Pride and arrogance only get in the way. You will be so busy trying to maintain your position that you will lose the focus 
on your purpose. You know, when you achieve status, it will be very hard to achieve and maintain that status if that is your end goal. Because there's always somebody who is richer, somebody who is smarter, somebody who is younger, somebody who is prettier, somebody who is more gifted, somebody even among Christian circles, more blessed than you. If you make your status the end, you will be sadly disappointed. There is also implied advice to those of us who have not achieved, you know, everything that we had hoped we would achieve. Those of us who feel like we're on the outside looking in. Those of us who feel we are middle management. Those of us who feel we are, you know, servants to those who have the prominence. There's an implied message to you as well. Let's congratulate and give a hand to all those who serve. Serve well positions that are not so prominent. You know, I know in my own ministry, to my embarrassment, God has, God has blessed my work. I don't even need to make a list, but in all the ways, well past my understanding, almost to my embarrassment. And, and I occasionally run into old classmates or even when I'm with people who weren't my classmates, you know, they're somewhat envious of, of um, the size of my congregation, the size of this congregation, uh, the things that we've been able to do and accomplish and, and the work that gets done, uh, even perhaps uh, the gifts that God has given me. And I, and I always smile at them because I say the only reason that you desire these things is because you've never had them. <laughs> different level, different devil. You know, you are spared a lot of the difficulty that comes from success. Be careful what you wish for. You know, I, I think the days that I was most happy was when I had a small congregation, a secretary, a retired pastor who helped in my visitation, and uh, my life was so much freer and less demands made upon me during those times. Lived in a small town, certainly had a smaller salary, but more than adequate to provide. In fact, we often have younger pastors who come through here and say, why would you possibly do this? This is quite a lot of work to me. I don't know why I would want to do that, you know. And there's a scripture that speaks to that too. It says the sleep of the labor, the sleep of the common person is sweet. Whether they have little or whether they have much, but as for those who are blessed, their abundance permits them no sleep. They have so many concerns upon their heart, so many things to worry about. I just want to caution you about your envy. Those of you who envy those who are more prominent. What is truly important has nothing to do with money, power, education, gender, age, race, or position in life. God has designed the world in such a way that the most important things and the things that bring true satisfaction in life are available to everyone, available to everyone. Rich people have no leg up on you. People in positions of authority and honor uh, are not better positioned uh, to have a greater life than you have. You know, Pastor Garrett and I have conducted many, many uh, funeral services in this place. And, uh, and, and we've seen families come in who won't even talk to each other. And, uh, and sometimes very prominent people arguing about estates and we've held, you know, some memorial services also for some very common people. And the place was lively and, and chatty. We had to calm them down because they were having such a good time, you know, reacquainting themselves with each other. And you get a sense of a person's life, you know, uh, at that point as you look back on the results of the relationships that they've been able to enjoy and build. I mentioned last week uh, several of the books that I've been reading recently. I like biographies and autobiographies. And there was one uh, by Nat King Cole uh, called Unforgettable. And uh, I'm fascinated by this guy because he grew up in a, a very poor uh, inner city Chicago kind of place, hung out with the jazz band, snuck out of his house at night. His dad was a preacher, uh, had a hard time accepting his son as a musician because of uh, all the problems that were associated with that profession, working late at night, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and yet he was dedicated to that. And, and one of his first breakthrough songs was one you would know if you heard, uh, but it's, it's not well known by its title. It's called uh, Nature Boy. And the, and the world resonated to the message of that song 
The song says, and then one day, one magic day, he passed my way, this nature boy, this common boy, this shy boy. And we spoke of many things, fools and kings. And then he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. And everybody knows that's true. The greatest thing you'll ever learn, no matter what gender, no matter what age, no matter what race, is to love and be loved in return. I, re I remember my oldest son when he was uh, dating in, in, in a somewhat serious relationship. It wasn't the woman that he married, but uh, he presented to her a poster of uh, all the great things that God has made available uh, that require no money because they had none. You know, they were going to college. And uh, I looked for it. I didn't find that one, but I did find this list of 50 things that money can't buy. You know, don't be jealous of those who have more than you. Live within your means by all means. And understand that the most important things in life don't require prominence, don't require money. Don't be jealous and don't, don't be envious of such people. Uh, just because you have money, number two, you won't necessarily have well-adjusted kids, but even those who don't often do. 33, you can have true love. 32, you can appreciate simple things in life. You know, you can, you can see a tree and be moved by it. Uh, you can have 18, and a great idea. 14, a worry-free day. Uh, 49, a proper perspective, a good reputation. Not everybody who has prominence has that. 38, a second chance in life. 27, a strong work ethic. 24, a good epitaph. <laughs> you know, at the end of your life, what will they say about you? You know, money has nothing to do with that. Everyone, all of us, are equally positioned to enjoy the greatest blessings of life. It is a revolution of humanity, a redefinition of greatness, as the Lord challenges those who are prominent to understand your position will not lead to greatness. The story finishes. Jesus said to his host, now when you give a luncheon or a dinner in the future, do not invite, and I would say only your friends. He's not saying you should never invite your friends, but you should think about this. Not only your brothers or your sisters, you should be like that Sergeant Haggerty in Chicago who saw the streetless, the homeless man out there and, and said, hey man, can I buy you a meal? I guarantee you that watching that man eat his meal was more satisfying than the sergeant eating his own meal that day. He said, or your rich neighbors, because if you do, you know how that works. It's just, you know, tit for tat. Uh, they will invite you back so that you can be repaid. That's how it works in social status society. No, when you give a banquet, when you want to, when you want to really be blessed by a meal, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And I contend that you won't even have to wait that long. You won't even have to wait that long. When we were in Idaho, um, we were uh, at, around uh, Mount Hood, and, and they have all kinds of, um, of orchards there. They grow every kind of orchard, every kind of fruit, plums and peaches and apples, and they have kind of, they call it the fruit loop. And it's just miles of driving through these orchards. And, and so we went down there and we stopped, and man, we just, we ate so much fruit, nearly made us sick. You know, and, and, and brought stuff that spoiled in the car because we just couldn't turn it down. It just smelled so good and jams and stuff. It's just incredible. And, and that night we stayed in town and we went to the Walmart. Now, uh, Mount Hood is kind of like Aspen or one of these mountain towns. Uh, you know, it's very elite in the shops downtown. There wasn't a Goodwill shop downtown. There was a Goodwill boutique <laughs> downtown. <laughs> you know, it's like I went in there and they were asking, you know, uh, uh, retail prices for used stuff. And I just thought, wow, incredible. But we went to the Walmart, and there we saw the pickers. We saw the people who worked, you know, in the orchards. You know, we, we saw all the Hispanic people and the Native American people who worked for the people who were prominent, who worked for the people who had the orchards and did all the picking. And uh, they were all paying with cash, of course, because that's how they got paid. And there's a guy in front of us, and, and he was juggling all these different things, and he had a couple of kids and his wife, and, and he came up short on his bill, and so they were figuring the cost of things and putting them back. And man, it just dawned on me that this is such an easy thing. I said, don't put that stuff back, man, let me pay for that. 
And I got to tell you, that was one of the highlights of my trip, to be able to do that. Therein lies the greatest blessing in life, you know, to be able to do for others because you have been blessed by God. Because ultimately, it's not what God wants from you. It's not that he wants to take your wealth away from you, your prominence away from you, but by sharing it and by using it for a means greater than yourself, it's what God wants for you. Let me just close with this scripture because I've been talking a long time. This passage from Paul to the young man, Timothy. Command those who are rich in this present world, and I don't just mean money, I I mean prominence, I mean influence. However you are blessed, use your blessing, not for yourself. And don't put your hope in your blessing because it's so uncertain, here today, gone tomorrow. But rather put your hope in God, build on him who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command those, (laughs) it goes so far as to say, Please beg them, tell them, command them to do good and be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. In they will lay up treasure for themselves, not just for others, but for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of, read that with me, the life that is truly life, that is truly life. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, help us. It, it's tough. We live in a material world. You know, and, and, and we strive for these things. And we work so hard for them that we want to enjoy them. And Lord, help us to realize that the greatest enjoyment is to use them and to share them and to accomplish things beyond ourselves, that they would be a means to an end and not, in, not an end to a, a means. Lord, help us to know the difference. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.